you know, after 33 years of doing this job, I get, this is full time, by the way, 33 years, I get, Greg, I just saw your stuff last week. It's hmm. unbelievable. <laughs> so, so there's, there's people finding it still all the time. I, I would have thought everybody who would have known the knife industry would have already heard of me, but obviously not, which is cool. So yeah, there's somebody new coming into it all the time. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to episode number 122 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies and every knife kind of person in between that spectrum to learn all about knives and knife collecting, hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anyone who loves knives. That's what we're all about. The Sunday episode is the interview show. And Bob, uh, one of our very rare repeat guests, but we have a repeat guest on today, Greg Lightfoot, who was back on episode 44. So you had a chance to catch up with him again today. Yeah, Greg Lightfoot, a legend of the folding... uh modern folding knife world. He made me a custom knife shortly after we uh, first had our conversation. And uh, about a year later, I felt like I wanted to talk to him about it. Uh, my first real custom folder. And uh, it was a pleasure to get him back on. And uh, then we ended up speaking with him on the uh, on the June 20th town hall. Right. And uh, listeners and uh, viewers got a chance to ask him questions. And uh, we had a ball. So a lot of a lot of Lightfoot lately. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of Lightfoot. Does this mean I'm gearing up for a for another purchase? Who knows. Well, stay tuned. There's a there's a teaser somewhere in the interview about uh, uh, about uh, folks that bought a Lightfoot and uh, his joy is uh, when they call him back and ask him for another. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> maybe you'll have to. Won't give anything away there. But Bob mentioned the uh, June twentieth town hall. If you want to catch that uh, replay, that's on the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube. The knifejunkie.com slash YouTube. So. Great interview, a little on the longer side for our interviews, so we want to get right into it without any further delay. Subscribe to the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. I'm back again with Greg Lightfoot. Greg, it's great to have you back on the Knife Junkie podcast. Right on. Thanks for having me again. Hey, it's my pleasure. So uh, after our last podcast, uh, you know, we talked about your career and we talked about uh, uh, the birth of... of uh, the knives you've made and your innovations and such, I ended up ordering a knife from you. And the reason I called you back recently is because I've had a chance to use and break this thing in. It's the element. Uh, you know, I like uh, more tactical materials, if you will, and you made me a tactical version of your element. And uh, it is awesome. It's finally, uh, not finally, but it is broken into the point I've used it enough where it is so super smooth. And uh, it, it's like rediscovering the knife. One thing about this knife that I love is that you are not afraid of making a big tactical knife, but also an artful and uh, designy knife. Um, where does this come from? This uh, What is the inspiration for this design? Well, it's uh, JBO, Jared Van Arlu, is that, that's one of his designs. And I always designed like a a business style, tactical style knife. And then when I hooked up with Jared, we started taking pleasing shapes and more artistic um, lines and so on, I guess is the word to, and still kept it in a tactical format, but you could use high-end materials and it would, just like you got there, like the knife you have, it's got a straight micarta handle where it also looks great with a, full Damascus handle as an example or a Damascus bolster and ivory scales, that kind mm, of thing. So yes. the knife fits, you know, both worlds basically because of the size of it and the shape. It's it's almost like a, when you grab it in your hand with the blade open, somewhat like a, a knuckle duster, like it, mm-hmm. it curves and fits your hand pretty nice. So it, you know, that, that um, all those elements make it the element, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, uh, it really, uh, when you grip it in a hammer grip, you have this nice puño, that's this back part, uh, the pommel, 
where uh, uh, <laughs> not only does it hold you in like a bird's beak here, but uh, you could you could knock a noggin with it if you had to. But you know what? This is not the kind of knife I'm carrying uh, when when I'm anywhere where I think my life is in danger. And let's let's be clear, I don't do that often anymore at all. Uh, <laughs> but this thing would fit the bill. And and then after after that, I I told you I had gotten a uh, the Microtech uh, Lightfoot LCC. A double action, and you said I was quite a lucky man to have uh, scored this one, and I was. It's half switchblade, half regular folder. You could fool a police officer with it if you had to, uh, or bribe him with it, I suppose, because it is such a fine knife and a, a grail for a lot of people for a long time. People like you, uh, acclaimed knife designers and knife makers, I'm really interested in where this all bubbled up from and where you came from. I know right now you live on a huge ranch. Uh, did you always live in Canada? Yes, I've, I've always lived in Alberta, basically, Alberta, Canada. So it's big, drastic season changes where you got 30 below Fahrenheit in the wintertime and then 80 degrees in the summertime and everything in between all, all the time, actually. You never know what it's going to be like. So I start off everything in in its small town called Lloyd Minster is where I started making knives because the reason it really started was I was, I was tree planting in the Rocky mountains in British Columbia, the next province west of me and found a magazine called Bla uh, knives illustrated. Sorry. And saw guys were making a living doing it. And I had dabbled around just playing, you know, in my home shop, sort of building crappy stuff. It never turned out really good, but when I saw it, there was guys making a living doing it. Because of my machine shop past and all this fabricating and welding and working on lathes and milling machines, I figured I could, if I did a little practice, I could come up with something that was pretty cool. Look, I don't know if we talked before about, you know, just looking at that book from David Boy. Did we mention that? I think you may past. have mentioned David Bowie, but but remind me about that. Well, it was an old book, and copyrighted in '73, and it was he was making them out of buzzsaw blades and stuff, and very archaic methods. And it it turned out that if I stuck with some of those principles that he had shown in there, you could start to to, to make a fixed blade. All right, and that's kind of how this started was in a fixed blade deal and i i basically learned as i went along made my first hologram blade on a four inch caster wheel from a push cart i put that on and put a belt over it and made it spin so i was grinding on that and it's a bit different today because you can go on to anything on instagram or youtube and find somebody telling you how to do something where Back when I was starting, mm -hmm. it, there was none of that. Like, it was pretty well, you learned on your own. There was nobody to tell you anything, because I was too far away from anybody to go over to the shop and have a boo. So it 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 took a lot to learn. And finally, it, the product started to come around so that it was reasonably good. And I started taking it to places that people wanted to buy them. And I was able to trade stuff for them and so on. So that was basically how it started. In the necess in a, in a way, I never had a decent knife. I thought that held an edge that felt good in my hand, so I figured I could design a better one, and that's how it came. Okay, so you mentioned David Boy, I, and I have to be honest, I I know him only from the David Boy dent, which is a, a feature of the backlock on Spider Co's, uh, where there's a little dip in the backlock, so you can't accidentally depress it by by squeezing really hard and horsing down on the okay. knife. Uh, so I guess that was an innovation of David Boy, but but uh, so what was this book and and what did you learn from it? Well, it was a pictures of him working in Arizona when he was really young. Okay, and he was he had these big monster buzzsaw blades and he was cutting out it with with a cutting torch shapes out of these blades and then silver soldering brass bolsters onto them and pinning on with you know brass pins and glue the handles and stuff like this and like i made i made a whole pile of knives that way mm -hmm. and was able to sell them and trade with them and so on but it was a real 
hard process to build them that way. So I, I sort of started adopting some different ideas, like not putting the bolsters on the way he did with solder and and using actual bar stock that I didn't have to cut it out of the, you know, take a cutting torch and cut the blades out and so on and right. making making the templates, tracing it onto a nice piece of bar stock. But the, the idea with him was is you could take and heat treat that steel basically in a coal, in any kind of a, a, a forge per se. You could get the heat, or heat up with a torch as an example and drop it in oil hmm. where all the high tech steels, you actually have to have a decent oven. So, and so eventually I realized that and got, got a proper oven. And long into my career after that, I contacted him and said, because there was a, I think I might have mentioned to you this before, but he had this picture of him with long hair and this intense look on his face. And he was cutting a blade out and he says, I get very intense when giving birth to a blade. I, mean, oh, I, just, <laughs> I thought that was just the best statement. So I, I contacted him and I said, David, uh, this is Greg Lightfoot. Do you, do you know who I am at all? And he goes, yes, I do, Greg. And I go, okay, that's pretty cool. I, I want to steal a phrase from you. I get very intense when I give birth to a blade. And he laughed and he thought that was pretty cool. And I said that to him. And of course he had on kind of some hippie bracelets and stuff, you know, from back in the seventies. And it, it was just the best to me. So that, that's kind of where I, it all started. And then the pocket knife thing came along when I, I realized that guys really wanted pocket knives more so than, mm -hmm. I mean, hunting knives. I mean, a hunting knife you could, you would get and use, but the pocket knife people would actually collect. So you wouldn't just sell a, I got a couple of hunting knives, you'd sell them five to ten pocket knives. And that was a you know a far better gig for me. So when I learned that, that was a big time long drawn out process. And believe it or not, I used to make double actions in my shop that would take me two weeks to make, and I would sell them for four hundred bucks. Wow. Like, okay, it was like this is way back in the day, but I mean yeah. They were extremely hard to do and so on, and it they worked. And I've actually seen some guys have sent me a picture back that showing one of them, there were a little button on the side, and there was a little teeter-totter inside that, that locked this leaf spring in place. And it was just a total cluster to make one. But you, So when I realized the liner lock was popular, well, that was 10 times easier to make than a than a double action pocket knife. So I, I stuck with the liner lock thing. And, you know, in actuality, I, I had wished I'd have went into slip joints as well, hmm. because because that's something I'm going to learn. And I've, I've, I've took courses from Joel Chamblin. I went to, to Atlanta and went to his, you know, or to Georgia, sorry, and went to his place. And hmm. But then old Joel, he's a great guy. I love him, but he, he does everything so backwoodsy that... <laughs> but it's like, like backwoodsy. Oh man, it's so hard to do it the way he does it. I've got to relearn that because making a double bladed slip joint mm -hmm. is is it really hard to do to make them nice, but they look so cool. And you know, guys actually they don't flick open and stuff, but just the fact that you you know you gently open it up and so on, it yeah, it, it has a kind of a timeless, you know thing to him yeah there's a real satisfaction that could be had from opening a slip joint that has nice action whether it has a half stop or not whether it snaps so uh yeah i do so do you carry and use a uh, uh a slip joint i mean i see your instagram feed and you are out in the wilderness on your ranch all the time what do you what are you carrying around a slip joint with I you mostly if i do carry anything of mine it, it's a a knife called the turbocharger and it's it's a I designed it. It's a it's kind of designed after a model I used to do back in the day called the suppressor. And if anybody's known my stuff over the years, the suppressor was a was an extremely popular knife, and it it um, was just big enough so I could put a a decent sized blade in it. But when I closed it, the top of the blade stuck out of the handle, obviously. But it may, it fit in your pocket reasonably well. So 
the turbocharger came along. That was not too long ago that I, that I designed that, but it is has a smelt look to it, longer, not so not so deep like the stuff that I normally make. And that's the knife that I that I actually have for myself. You know, but the thing is, you make something for yourself, and then somebody, oh, well, that's pretty cool, and you you sell it. Like it, it doesn't seem to last very long when you. You know, to carry what what I make is because you make a living at it. So you <laughs> so you take it, you pull it apart, you fix it all up, make it all real nice, and and basically it's a brand new knife, and then you sell them, right? So that that is a repeating theme uh, in in knife makers I talk to because I'll ask sometimes if they carry their own knives. They're like, "Do you carry your own paycheck around with you all the time?" I'm like, "No, <laughs> no, you don't." Uh, so what are, what are the challenges of making a slip joint? Uh, like, why is is making a slip joint that much harder than making a uh, uh, a one of these beautifully tuned liner locks or a frame lock or something like okay. that? Okay, well, a single bladed one is not that big of a deal. But when I went to Joel's place, and it, we'll be talking about Joel a lot on that end of it because that's the guy that he made me one. Okay, and the, they're absolute beauts. Okay, and so I'm sorry, what's his last name, Joel? Chamblin. Okay, I, I'm sure I, I'm uh, late to the game, as I usually am. Chamblin, I will check that out. Check him out. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Yeah, so he uh, would always have these beautiful knives at his plate, like, at his table next to me. He was right next to me at the blade show. I would always go, man, Joel, them are beautiful. And we would chat and stuff and became good friends. And so I went to his place and we started. So, so I went there with the intent that, okay, we're going to make a, we're going to make a double two bladed slip joint here. And, so let's get at it. So his shop was sort of suspect to me, like it didn't have a whole lot of stuff in it and everything. And I'm wondering how are we going to do this? And so <laughs> he starts, he starts getting into it and we go on along and along. And finally I say to him, Joel, you're kidding me, right? Like we're not going to do it like this. And he goes, well, son, this is how I do it. And I, you know, I could <laughs> hardly even attempt to do it the way. And so I, we we flogged away at there for man, it must have been three, four days, like just flat out, solid, flat out hard to, to get this knife done. And I got it done and two bladed and I, I put sort of my spin on it a little bit and put a slanted bolster on it and stuff like that, and jig bone for the handle and hmm. I did a really cool grind on a, on the two blades and it turned out really sweet, but if I was to sell that knife, okay, it's four thousand dollars. Like, it was, <laughs> yeah. that's a that's how much time it took me to build that. Like, it was just psycho. And then you got to get everything perfect. It's got to look the back of the knife has to be perfect when it's half open, mm-hmm. closed, and open. Everything has to be flush oh. all the time, right? Well, well, Greg, I think there's some debate about whether that half stop it needs to be flat. That that kind of seems to be a useless anal retentive sort of detail i mean yeah. i like it i like it just the same uh gec I, I have a small collection of great eastern cutlery slip joints and some of them do that and some of them don't i have one case knife that does that and uh all the others that don't uh have a flush back spring on the half stop are still awesome i think that is oh, yeah. just one of those things that collectors like drop shut action oh yeah see see drop shut action is not me okay like that's <laughs> That's just totally not me. Like you design a knife to have to have that drop type action. The pivot's got to be in a certain spot, okay, to make that happen. So, like a lot of the knives that I do, they're just not designed to do that. Like you know, and the the, the purpose of having that big thing in your hand there, so that that huge personal defense monster is gonna flop shut. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think the drop shut instinct comes necessarily from the the self defense or tactical end of things. But incidentally, this knife, your your element is like is nearly drop shut. But that's only well, because it's got a big heavy blade and ball bearings. But you uh, bet <laughs> that is. Yeah, they, they, see, you get enough weight out front there, it'll it'll come down. But like now, I'm just just got going with JVO on it. Like I do a knife called the Pit Boss. Mm-hmm. It was the first model that I ever did with him. So now we're doing the the Mini Pit Boss, the Min Pin, I'm calling it. <laughs> and like you know, it's it's very very short. So 
you know, you don't have that, the ability to do that, but the knife is going to be extremely cool anyways. So uh, I'm going to have one of those ready to show you. So you say very, very short, uh, but your knives uh, tend towards the four inch blade or, or close to. Right. So what is very, what is very, very short in, three in your book? Okay. Yeah. Three inches. Okay. Three inches for me is that's a, I usually, smallest I used to do is three and a quarter. So does it maintain the same heft? My element is 0.78 inches thick. Does it mean, I mean, you know, does it have that same sort of beefiness or is it a... No, you scale everything down. Because scale it you have a three inch. Yeah, it's, it's kind of kind of fits in the palm of your hand. So you, you kind of have to scale accordingly. Like it's mm-hmm. pretty hard to, if you, it'd be like holding a brick if I, you know, if I didn't slim it down and stuff. So, but, you know, I, I decided that, like, a lot of the guys, they won't carry that honking element there. It gets, they'll take it and show it off and play with it. And, but but to actually put it in your pocket and walk around with that, it's, it's you know, it's a pretty big knife. So the, the trend is it's going both ways. Some guys still like their huge knives and, and some people want a small one. So you kind of have to you know, just go with whatever's out there. And I, I, mean, I don't mind changing up my format a little bit and doing something different. And totally different for me is a three-inch blade. Yeah, but it's still in the Greg fight, uh, Lightfoot language, and it's still a Greg Lightfoot knife. To me, it's 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 no different. It's just an, an issue of scale. And uh, uh, yeah, I know what you mean about carrying the element. It, it, it does depend. I, I wouldn't carry this with dress slacks, but in a, in a, right. pair, of, in a pair of jeans, uh, and I'm not a skinny jean wearer. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this thing is is awesome. However, sometimes uh, just because it's it's prized, you know, and with certain prized things, you think about where you're going or what you're going to be doing, and you decide, eh, maybe I'll bring something I can thrash on and won't be all nervous about, you know. Well, but, another thing too, if you're in public and you pull that out, <laughs> flip it open, yeah. it's like somebody thinks. You know, the next thing you're going to pull out of your jeans is a handgun or something. Like Uzi, yeah. yeah, they don't think that they don't really equate that to be a tool so much as something terrifying. Right. So you that's why it's good to, like you say, you sort of pick where you're going to go and what knife you're going to carry us to the spot you're going to go. So with the slip joint you made, the, the double edge or the double bladed slip joint, uh, I'm curious, what were the blade types? And, and I'm going to guess before you get into it, I'm going to guess. Uh, uh, modified clip point and modified worn cliff. <laughs> well, no, we had a we had a a, a Bowie style. Mm-hmm. Okay, a Bowie was the and then the, the other one is that it's kind of looks like a spade on the end. I don't I don't remember the name of that. Is it the spay blade? Yeah, uh, that yeah, the one that it's yes. meant for spaying animals. Uh, yeah, you bet. It's a, a lovely, yeah, it was, it was <laughs> lovely purpose trapper, for that. Trapper, sort of an idea like mm-hmm. the. See, the thing is with Joel, he just would look at a picture and then would make that knife from the picture. He never he never had any training on the insides. He just learned that way. So making all them springs and, man, it's, you know, my sphinx really slams shut when I think of it <laughs> because it was so hard to do. You know, like the, the, these, these liner locks are nothing to make compared to one of those, for me anyway. Maybe there's some guys out there that are really good, but you know. Right. Well, you know the collectors of of custom slip joints are looking, and they're looking hard, just like the collectors of anything are looking and they're looking hard at their details. So I could see how you're moving in from a different realm of knife making into that. You have to before you release anything out there into the world of slip joint collectors, you got to make oh, yeah. sure it passes muster. I could see that. Yeah, very important that statement right there. Very yeah. important. So you made a trapper that's a spade blade and a and a clip point and it's a jack setup meaning it's on one pivot at one side right yeah yeah okay. one side you bet so uh I, I the two times we've spoken I've seen arrows behind you in in various quivers you have a lot of arrows uh, around you and your last name is Lightfoot and and it makes me wonder do you have uh native uh, american native north american no, canadian no that that would be Greg standing on the road or Greg by the fire. That would be an Indian name. Like uh-huh. Lightfoot is from England. 
Oh, that's where my that's where my grandfather came from. Was from England. I'm I'm major into collecting custom handmade rattlesnake skin backed bows. So I've got. Wait, wait, wait! Back up and say that again. You're into collecting. Say that again. They're called they're called self bows. They're a bow that's made from a single piece of wood, and they got rattlesnake skin on the backs of them. It's just a backing material. They use an actual rattlesnake skin. Does that keep it springy? Is that no? It's it's just more of a cool look. Okay, gotcha. You know, if it was if it was sinew or you know something like that. But this is not like these are just straight pieces of wood. I, I actually like the way arrows look, so I have them on display all over the place. And there's cl- there's a clump of them right in here. Yeah, you can just sort of see them back there. But when you shoot lots, you break and lose lots of them, so mm-hmm. you you need to have lots of arrows around. Well, I was going to say, so you you live out on 167 acres of Alberta ranch. What do you what do you do when you're not making knives? I, I guess you shoot a lot of bows and arrows. What else? I actually dabble a lot in mountain biking and building motorcycles. I'm major into. I'm turning a Sportster Harley Davidson Sportster into an uh, adventure bike, which is not not a standard thing to do. So I that takes. I, I really love that. Like I can go and spend countless hours working on that bike. And it just time just flies. We have a major kind of like a mountain bike park out here where this it's all rolling hills with trees and grass and lots of water that you can, you know, drive beside and so on. And it's just phenomenal mountain biking here for the prairies. Like it's not Rocky Mountain downhill stuff, mm-hmm. but as we're rolling hills and going down trails through the to the bush and stuff, it's pretty cool. And the thing is, I don't have to load up to go anywhere. I just go out the door, grab my bike, and go riding. And that, that makes it so much better than even if there's a better spot to go, but you have to load up and drive there, that's a pain. We're here. Yeah. I've made the best of it, you know, on this place. So I do a lot of that, and I do a, a lot of air gun shooting. Like I, I collect, once again, I'm always collecting stuff. I've got so much <laughs> collections, but high-end air guns. They're precision, beautiful instruments that don't make a whole lot of noise. So you can set up at 50 yards, as an example, and 75 yards and shoot and be deadly accurate, but you're just not making a boatload of noise and scaring everything away and, you know, causing a problem that way. Do you hunt with that? I mean, can you collect food with that? Oh, yeah. You can hunt. Like, I hunt gophers. Like, it's a crows magpies that's just gardening <laughs> yeah like it's not like i don't if I, the hunting I, I hunt lots with my bows but if you're gonna hunt i actually use a like a gun that you can like a 30 odd six or a yeah. seven millimeter magnum something you can shoot with but i find that with all the stuff that i do hunting and and which is why why it's not called getting hunting a lot of times takes a lot of time where i don't get anything done and my mind just sits there in races where if I set up to shoot the air guns, I'm shooting a group, five shot groups or setting eggs up at 70 yards and watching them blow up, you know, <laughs> things that are, it's, it's instant gratification. And then I just stop and I go back to whatever I'm doing. Where hunting is a, it's a big drawn out process to do it correctly. I used to do it lots. Last year I raised a boatload of pheasants <laughs> and I got a dog that will actually flush them and get some and, Shooting pheasants is fun. It's it's not that hard, but raising the birds up and letting them go and having the dog watch the dog go grab them and stuff like that is is actually pretty good. And I have a really nice top shelf Browning Satori over and under shotgun. That's a real nice gun. So and I enjoy shooting it because it feels great and looking at it when I'm not shooting it and stuff like this. So it those are some activities that I do a lot. Sporting clays. Another one I do a lot, you know, I like clays. sporting clays as well. Lots well, so how, how does this, okay, so this is your daily life. You go outside, or you, you make knives, obviously, and then you go outside, you work on your motorcycle, you hunt pheasants that you raise, you collect stuff. You said you're a mad collector. Do you still have a knife collection? Does a knife maker uh, such as yourself still have a knife collection? Well, you know, believe it or not, 
I designed a knife back in the day for Columbia River Knife and Tool called the Urban Shark. Okay. Yeah. And I get this. I'm looking at two of them right now. I've got that's that's my knife collection up here in my room. Like the, the, I don't collect a lot of knives. I I have them kicking around, but it's more you know the, this is the one I use to to clean pheasants. This is the one I use to gut a pig. I don't really have. You know, a set of beautiful knives that I sit and talk about, but <laughs> shark shark's teeth. You know, I got a collection of shark's teeth oh, wow. that all sit and just make gug eyes over. I, I really like that. Okay. Well, I'm so, I'm I'm not surprised by that because that's your logo, and that's it. You've you've mentioned before that that's what a lot of your designs are based on the sort of uh, biological shapes found in well sharks primarily. You bet. And, yes. uh, and I grew up, I think I mentioned this to you, uh, uh, I grew up drawing madly. And I went through about a 10-year f- period of time where all I wanted to draw were sharks, and I knew all the different sharks. And uh, it, and uh, so it's always resonated with me. Um, but so how does this life of, of adventure, I, I will call it that because I live a life of suburbia, and I, I love my life, don't get me wrong, but you can't help but... Uh, admire someone else's lifestyle and it's so different and uh, so seemingly idyllic. How does all of that feed into your knife making, your knife designing? And, and, and I'll preface that by saying, even though I asked you to make this tactical knife for me, I am repeatedly stunned by the, the beautiful knives you make and post on Instagram with the, with, the, with the materials, especially the combination of natural materials and man-made materials. How does this lifestyle that you lead inspire these knives well basically because my head is not full of despair and wishing i was someplace else and all that it's like i you know i'm everybody wants to go someplace and i'm already there so it's like if it's time to design you know you sit down and oh there we go it you know things to start to flow as an example and then you know and, and then being teamed up you know, with a couple of designers, uh, JBO, Jared Van Arlu, and another guy, Lorian Arnold, who, I, who designed the Catalyst and the Endorphin. Those two designer guys also, if I need to have some, like say I'm having a, your brain just isn't designing. Well, it's cool to be able to call on those guys and have something, you know, sweet come my way that we can talk about and tweak a little bit or whatever. And then I go ahead and start making it. The cool thing is, though, Material combinations that I use and materials that I use, like I specialize in natural materials. Like I can do woods, ivory, pearl, like those mm-hmm. kind of things, which I'll, I'm going to tell you something. Doing a piece of carbon fiber or a piece of micarta is dead nuts easy compared to those materials, okay? Straight so, sculpture. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, you could take a piece of carbon fiber and basically start it on fire and it'll stay straight. Wood and these and ivories and all these other materials, you touch them wrong, get too much heat somewhere, they want to taco chip and pull them away. And so it, it takes a bit more skill to, to, to use them. But because that's how I started this whole career off was making things with wood and bone. So in transferring that over, that's another reason why I like, you know, this smaller knife stuff to... You can you can find a really beautiful piece of, of ivory, as an example, three inches long. It's a little harder to find one six inches long, okay, like a five inches long. To, and so th- that's why, you know, these smaller knives and stuff like that, too, they're really going to accent my use of natural materials. So to me, making a, a knife that when it's done, it looks like an antique. In the, in the way the materials, they, they the color and so on, the texture, but it's but it's brand new. You know what I mean? And not that that's cool to me. I use not or man made stuff as well, but the bulk of my high end stuff is more going to natural stuff. Right. So with the pit boss, the mini pit boss, the min pin, as you're calling it, do you see yourself uh, opening up into a new kind of a uh, point of view in creating knives i mean um because you are right most people uh, uh do have more of a taste for the the 
the smaller knives the, because they're more palatable to the public. They're easier to carry in, in more different kinds of clothes. They're easier to take into public spaces and such. Do you think that uh, designing knives a little bit smaller is going to change your thinking a little bit, evolve your thinking, stretch your thinking? Well, what I think it's going to do is it's going to, when people that are, say they, they come across a carryable little piece of extreme jewelry, which would be a small knife, they'll go, well, that's pretty cool. And then they'll take a look at my feed and they'll go, wow, look at that, that big bitch there. That's, that looks great. Okay. They're going to look at all my other stuff as well. And they're going to maybe want one of each as an mm -hmm. example. Okay. So, you know, I've been making this big stuff for a long time. And so you make some smaller ones and they'll like, they'll say, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, but I'm, I kind of want one of these great big suckers here as well to go with my life bikes collection. Right. So I don't think it'll, it'll be a, a huge change of anything. It's just the fact that I'll be able to get some really deluxe ivory and mm. bits of pearl that are going to fit these knives. <laughs> to, to put, to put a piece of pearl on that element you're going to have to get a serious piece of shell to put that element there. So. Right, right. Well, yeah, it, but I, I, I think, I wager that it will, because you're not just taking the knife and putting it through a CAD and scaling it down, because that wouldn't feel right. You're, you still have to design it as a smaller knife. And and to me, it, it seems like uh, that that will inevitably lead to new ideas. Uh, I, I guess I'm <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing what a small light foot looks like because uh, I'm used to the big the the big hunks of you know. I think you're gonna like it. So I, I honestly it they it's they're, they're cool and just that it fits in the in the palm of your hand idea is it's just a bit different. And it thing is you can take that like you say in any old pair of any dress clothing you want, drop it in there. And, Take it, if it and if it's done pleasing with you know some really nice material so that it is actually like I'm always talking extreme jewelry, you show it off to somebody and they'll you can have a, a conversation about it and nobody jumps back or their eyes get big and buggy or you know none of this stuff. They just sort of oh that's cool. It's you know and and even if it flicks out, which they're all gonna be bearing up actuated and so on, flippers, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, the, the person will be introduced in a little bit less of an aggressive manner to my product. Let me ask you this. You mentioned uh, less of an aggressive manner. That's kind of funny. Uh, but you, you mentioned uh, ball bearings in the pivot. Now, I'm just going to be devil's advocate. Why? Why not phosphor bronze washers? I hear speak of, and I've never pushed any of my knives to actually uh, um, you know, it, know this for myself, but I hear that bearings are less robust. You can get pieces of grit in there and then it's not as smooth why why do you choose bearings over say phosphor bronze washers well kind of like i guess a guy would buy a, a real high-end lexus and he would drive that in the street maybe or he'd buy an old beater dodge truck it's got all rusted out and he would take that out and abuse it like it's it's kind of like i got i've done lots of tests believe it or not with bearings and just poured sand in there and it's worked okay i don't know what how much more abuse you can possibly do than pour sand in it but to me that that smoother action like with with bear with washers that hydraulic action is cool and i used to make them exclusively that way hmm. bronze bear bronze washers or, or, a, or a plastic type washer but then all of a sudden it had to fall clothes, okay <laughs> and that freaking fall and close stuff well you're not going to get that to happen with a with a bronze washer knife it doesn't work the same for me anyways maybe somebody can but you know you got to tighten the pivot up somehow like that microtech that you've got there mm -hmm. that's got bronze washers in it okay and the way that's done is is the there's a, a sleeve over the pivot that's machined absolutely perfect. So when you tighten that knife down as tight as you can, it can only go so tight, right? What's that called? A, a, a um, what do they call I that? I can't remember what Tony called it, but that's that's a one another way of doing it. Okay, so you have all these little precision made sleeves that slip over. And I so guess so basically, you can't it, you can crank it all the way down, make it totally tight, but you're not gonna 
stop the blade from moving. Yeah, it's because it not. is a, and now listeners are yelling at the radio right now, yelling at their speaker. What is it, people? Let me know. <laughs> I, it's driving me See, nuts. I, I don't know what it's called. I can't remember. But, yeah, you know, it's every different way. If people perfect it, that's th cool. You know what I mean? Like, there's nothing wrong with any of it. No. I just happen to... To, I don't mind machining the bearing pockets and dropping in the bearing. I like used to use that system where there, were, there wasn't a case bearing where you counted out ball bearings and put them in there. And so the IKBS. Yeah. 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 And then a guy took his knife apart and he had a he had a confetti thing. All these bearings falling over the floor. And it's like, yeah. and that this is the case bearing is a is a superior way of doing it. Now I see even those guys making bearings that are even over the top with brass cases and ceramic balls in these little brass housings and just so over the top that and it's it's the only like I, I guess you can always make something better but it's kind of like this but there works is, there this is works. a concept of diminishing returns you know you can you can yes. go out of your mind making it you know uh infinitesimally smoother but you know to what end right i, I mean there there's, there's so many people that they'll pick up as an example of mine, which won't, it's a model that won't flop close. We use that and they'll go snap it. Wow. That's, that sounds so sweet. I love the sound of that. It, I'll buy that. Okay. Now that is how you know that the person is not blowing attention up your butt. He's, he bought it from you. Okay. And that's important. So, so then you go to the table and it's a different action and, oh, he might buy that too. Right. But I know that. What I do, guys, women, guys, they like it. So, and I'm going to, I don't really have to reinvent the wheel here on that. So you're up in Alberta and uh, we were talking on the phone the other day and you were talking about some of the challenges uh, with the recent world events with COVID-19 and the and the world border quarantines oh, and such. Man. So what, what are the challenges you're facing in trying to make some of your damn sweet knives uh, up there in kind of the Netherlands? Just getting something shipped to me, you know. When when nobody's working, it's hard to to get things shipped. Like the post office, there, it's just a total cluster. Like, so you order stuff, and it takes forever to get it to you. And that's been an issue of mine. So everything's been helping me ship courier, FedEx, or something because you can't use use ordinary post, and it's it's getting here. That that's basically it. That's the only thing that's really been bothering me because anybody who wants to work. Like in a knife making community, people are workers. It seems that they all want to work, okay? And so they they don't want to sit there and play video games in the basement for and get paid to do so. So they're wanting to to kick butt. And with that that statement, there is people that are sitting. There maybe things have slowed down at work because they can't go to work. So they're they're looking on the computer and they're ordering stuff, mm -hmm. and they're like which. Which is great because that's basically how my job is done. I put a put a shingle out, being Instagram or in the, in the website, and then people come by it and they go, "Wow!" And you know, after thirty three years of doing this job, I get this is full time, by the way. Thirty three years, I get Greg. I just saw your stuff last week. It's mm. unbelievable. <laughs> so, so there's there's people finding it still all the time. I, I would have thought everybody who would have known the knife industry would have already heard of me but obviously not which is cool so yeah, there's somebody new coming into it all the time that's right with uh with youtube and uh social media and and with the uh, the proliferation i mean there are so many knife brands and designs and beautiful i mean these are all luxury items i i always underline that i mean if, if you're really just you know a lot of people like to get righteous about their knives well i use my knives well yeah. okay fine but these are all luxury items. Really, you could get away with your entire life with a buck one ten, dude. So don't tell me <laughs> don't don't get on your high horse. We're we're materialists, or I should say, we're enthusiasts for a certain thing. You know, we collect these luxury items. Uh, Blade Show, you know, Blade Show is is the is the bread and butter of a lot of knife makers. There's their yearly nut, or what what propels them forward into their next year. Um, with that being postponed till August and then, and then who knows what, how is that affecting you? And how do you think that's going to affect the knife world and, and all this that's going on? Well, to me, 
what's happening is the powers that be don't want you to travel anywhere. So they want you to stay home and sit in your basement and play video games and worry about getting Cordoba virus, okay, which is not, it's got stick all to do with me, I'm telling you. I don't get sick and nobody that I know is sick and it's just a total, freaking pardon me, but don't get me going on this because this is a joke to me, this whole thing. I don't, I've never, I have a social distance from Dick. I just go to do all my stuff same as normal. Like I don't, but, but with the Blade Show, they, they want to keep that thing going. I mean, the people that are organizing it and everything, they're, but nobody's going to be able to come from any other country. So, because they can't border BS, right? So this is a problem. And I feel sorry for a lot of people who are banking on that because it was a big deal every year. I've had, I've been to the Blade Show over 20 years, like never missed, like go, go, go. And always enjoy it. It's a fantastic gig. But now they've managed to st- stop restaurants from working. That's at the beginning of time. You could just pop in and grab a pint of something and a slab of something, right? Need it. Now, oh, gee, that's taboo now. You can't. Yeah. So, so this whole thing about, you know, being in a room where you've got a whole bunch of people. Well, no, that's, you know, anyway, that's, that's dangerous now or something. So you can't go do that for me because I've been around, I'm established. And I'd like to think that I do product that people want to buy. They're still contacting me and ordering. Like, it's not like I'm, you know, and the thing is, I don't, I'm not driving to the airport and I'm not buying a plane ticket and I'm not getting a hotel so you're not moving as many at one time like you would at the Blade Show, but it's still coming in. And I, you know, I'm sitting in my chair, half asleep, and all of a sudden, ding, the phone dings, and somebody is ordering something, right? So that's cool. So, so I, I'm, it, not, I'm not complaining about the work slowdown at all. In a way, uh, I'm asking a man who's already earned his bones, and you don't rely necessarily on Blade Show to, to, to keep interest up. Because you've already got your name, I, I I do I do feel bad for uh you know up and comers or people who were maybe relying on this blade show to be like this is going to be my breakthrough moment you know this yep. everything is leading up to this well it's going to have to wait a year which is unfortunate you know I was recently talking to Dave Wattenberg of Protect Knives and he was saying that when you buy a knife and we were talking about buying uh, American made knives he was like when you buy a knife. You're, you're not only supporting that knife maker or that knife company, but you're supporting everything around it. The people who supply the hardware and the materials and the coffee around the shop where it's made and the, everything, the restaurants, everything that relies on that, that uh, business entity or everything that, uh, that it feeds into, it benefits every time you buy a knife. No, no matter where you're buying it, from what locality. And, uh, that, that, that resonated with me and, and, and for me, it seems like uh, you're in a lucky spot, you know, because you're Greg Lightfoot and people know your knives and know your brand at this point. Yeah, they do. But it's like you luck seems to be the harder I work, the luckier I get. OK, kind of an idea. Mm-hmm. So it's like it's not not so much luck. It's just so that see the thing is, what I find interesting now is that everybody can instantly look at on something and learn how to make a knife. OK, and then. And then become the flavor of the month and win an award instantly. Okay. Where, and then, but the, here's a ticket about that. A year from now, where is that guy or girl? Like, what are they doing? Okay. So it's like longevity in an industry. It says something that I think is cool. And it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work. It's, it's, there's, there's obviously some breaks that come along. People that, you know, say, this is pretty cool. I'm going to promote this for you or whatever it may be. But, you're saying the blade show shows in general, the blade show is the best because you can go there and buy supplies and find that perfect piece of ivory, that perfect piece of pearl that, and and then put it in your satchel and come home. All right. I use the word satchel. Like it's like a, (laughs) an old word, but it's like, you you know, that's just thing. You can just stuff it in your, yeah. You throw down your pouch of coin and put the the ivory in your satchel and you, you sell it forth. (laughs) And you're gone. Right. (laughs) And so now I say, I got to order it online and you hope that's the piece they send you. Okay. So, you know, and where, you know, I don't know, just something about seeing stuff in person and also too, 
you know, you, you wander around there and for 20 years you've been going there. So you're high fiving and butt smacking all the guys you've never seen for a year. And, you know, it's, it's fun to bullshit there, right? So and it's not going to happen this year. So you got to basically, I, I like everybody who's ordering for me, I like to call them to call me so that I can actually talk to the guy. Like that seems to be somewhat of a thing of the past too. It's like they want to email you 50 times yeah. and I, I I just go, no, just phone me. If you're interested, give me your phone number. I'll call you whatever. So we can get this squared away once, you know, done. And where at, at, at Blade, you, you would have a lot of guys calling you beforehand. Yeah, I'm going to come by your table. And they might even have ordered a couple of knives and they're ready to be delivered at the, at the show. Right. So I'm, I missed that when June came around this first of June here came around. I was like, yeah, we're not there. You yeah. know? So it was a bit of a bummer, but I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you, the, the, the thing is knife people are still wanting to buy knives and still yep. liking knives. And, and so let's just hope it continues rocking. It will, it will, it will, just like every other industry has picked up in a virtual way. I mean, the knife industry is so hugely virtual anyway. People watch YouTube videos to get a feel of a knife and then they buy the knife and, uh, you know, on, on online. So, I mean, I don't see much of a long term dent because I think knife junkies are knife junkies and they, and they, they want the knives. It's like any sort of collector and, and, uh, it, it might yeah. take a minute. There, there will be, there will be disruptions and people will suffer, no doubt. Uh, on the production side of it, but uh, but when things even out, there are always going to be knife lovers, and there will be the artisans and the artists and the knife makers who you know are providing that. So you know, I'm not too worried. <laughs> I'm glad to be one of them. I, I really enjoy my job after all these years. I don't mind going to work Monday morning, okay? And mm -hmm. for a lot of people, that's like you know driving a stick in their eye. Like oh, geez, Monday morning work for me. It's like I'll just go down and start working again. It's not that big of a deal. So 33 years is a long time on anything. I don't care what it is. You know, you, this has been a while. And to, to, to me, there's still that enthusiastic talking with the guy who wants to buy it, you know, the back and forth banter, the, you know, making it come together and, you know, and, and all the rest of it. It's just all, I enjoy it. That's something that's important to me is I enjoy it. I'm not in this anymore. Because, you know, I, 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 I got to feed myself. I can't, you know, and as I'm scrambling, when I'm making one now, it's like you're taking your time and you're, you're really putting everything into it because you want the guy in the end, when he, when he gets that package and opens it up, he goes, wow. And then calls you back and orders another one. <laughs> that's yeah. another, that's how you know they liked it. All right. Well, hint taken. <laughs> uh, just in uh, before we close, I want to ask you this question, and 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 uh, not sure if it's a hot button question for you or not. But how do you feel about? So I've I've spoken with a number of people. We do a live show on Thursday nights. Spoken with a number of knife enthusiasts about, uh, especially during the the lockdown, about buying from North America, basically. And uh, a lot of talk came up about um, OEMs like. Uh, Riot and uh, and We Knife Company and uh, Reich, that style of production, except in the United States or in Canada or North America somewhere, how would you feel about having your designs produced? Because I know you're pretty exclusively custom these days. Would you ever feel comfortable releasing any of your, your designs to some sort of production, uh, be it foreign or or North American? Or well, basically. North America is the ticket because all these countries, just as your design is is slated to hit the the table or to hit some catastrophic failure happens in some other country that then slows down or maybe even stops it altogether, right? So USA made stuff. People would just be working instead of freaking protesting, working and getting this stuff done. It would be, it's fantastic, but there's always, it's easier to, to, to complain and to nasal and to get down and get it done. Where so all that manufacturing used to be in the States, well, it never was in Canada, but in the States, mm -hmm. tons of it. Then it all flew across the pond over to China and wherever over there. And so now it's slowly coming back, but it's like 
anybody who's got anything going on in these countries right now, it's not coming nowhere. It's done. There's they're not shipping that stuff. You know, it's just there's always some issue. It seems and it's po- where the political or whatever. This time it just so happens to be everybody's scared scared of this disease or something, right? So, well, then suppose suppose everything was fine and and there was a healthy and thriving U.S. or Canadian or North American, we'll call it OEM knife production scene where there was more than uh, more than you know, just millet and dauntless and, and some of these great companies that are making beautiful, great knives on an OAM basis. But, uh, you know, in very small batches, if there was a more thriving market, would you have light foot knives? Would you ever consider having your designs produced, uh, wider? Sure. It's, it's always the, the, if somebody's thinks they're hot enough to want to invest money in tooling, they they're going to put an investment in that. So that would be cool. You know what I mean? And, it just gets out there. There's always the guy though that wants it exclusively made from me. So I would I would always be doing that job. Oh, yeah. But yeah, you know, just then you could you you'd have. A, I, I've been to, to different factories all over the place. Actually, you know, one of the most fun I had was at the Case Factory, mm. looking at them slip joints and stuff. There, I, I really enjoyed that. But the thing is, I've designed different knives, and nothing has ever really like the. The foot or the uh, LCC you have there, it was a seriously sweet knife, and it just didn't end up going the way I wanted it to, of course. But it was a sweet, sweet knife. So I know it can happen. It's just it's got to be the one that, at some point in time, that somebody takes it. But see now, I'm telling you, there's these companies that are all making pretty good quality stuff. All these computer geeks. They've really got those those CNC machines and stuff dialed so that they can make some pretty cool stuff. But there is a collector out there that doesn't want that. Okay, so they want they don't want a cookie cutter knife that that four hundred other guys can have in the run of four hundred. We'll use that as an example. They want it to be unique and sure. a one off. And so that's that's where I'm, I'm fitting in there, no problem. Yeah, I I believe that, but I also believe that. Your designs are a- appealing across a broader spectrum that uh, having having your designs within uh, w- with a regular consumer's reach could be awesome. And uh, we oh, look yeah. forward to that in the future because, I mean, like I'm just looking at this element and, and this could be translated so many different ways in a more um, affordable form. I'm, I'll just say that as frankly as I can. Like this, this, this is a, a, a dear possession in my knife collection. Uh, but you know, it's not every day I spend that money on a knife and, and most people don't. So, uh, I, no. but I could see people really resonating with this design. So that's I why I love I, it if something like that happened. I mean, it's like, it'd be cool if it was made in the U S like made here. And then, so there was an issue. You just call up and you have a chat. There's yep. no interpreter needed. There's nothing like it's no hand puppets. Just and you don't have to worry about that. external. You don't have to worry about world politics and right. and, and 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 foreign affairs. Uh, you know when you're when you're doing your business. Well, I, I think uh, I, I think eventually a head of steam will be built up around here to have that kind of an operation because I think there are plenty of designers and makers like yourself who could, you know, everyone could benefit by having a light foot in their, in their pocket. And, you know, you, you, you might still be spending 400 bucks for it from a, from a, a U.S. OEM, but it, it's, it's worth it. And it's not uh, spending 2000 bucks on a beautiful cherry piece. So, right. so it's yeah. a way to get your designs in a lot more pockets. You bet. Yeah. It's, that would be great. You bet. Sure. <laughs> All right. I guess I got to start a company now. <laughs> Greg Lightfoot, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast again. It's been a pleasure. I've I've had such a great time kind of getting to know this knife, uh, the the your the element you made for me and breaking it in and now I feel like it's in that sweet spot and it it's truly mine though it hasn't cut me yet, but I'm sure it will cuz it's damn sharp. Thank you for coming on again. Hey, thank you for having me again. It was great. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. 
kind of a more in-depth uh, interview with Greg this time, uh, Bob, versus last time where you got into more of the uh, personal lifestyle stuff, which uh, I know we've talked about off air a lot of times whenever Lightfoot's name comes up and you're just kind of, the only word I can say is, is I was going to say mesmerized, but that's not the right word. It's kind of, kind of fascinated by his lifestyle. Yeah, I think it's a vicarious thing. I'm like, wow, right. to live out there in the wilderness with <laughs> motorcycles and a, and a homemade sauna and a sweet house and a knife building shop. I mean, he, he from my perspective, from my per, uh, suburban perspective, he's living the other life, right? if you will. Uh, but what I got to say, uh, I'm, I'm excited about, uh, about Greg's... Um, trending small with some of his work uh the mini pit boss now he he's he will always be working in his normal format that sort of larger beefy tactical format uh with the with the super sweet uh materials but now moving down to the min pin the mini pit boss i'm excited to see how his designs translate into uh what some might find a more pocketable format uh, i will carry around uh whatever I find cool, no matter how big or heavy, but uh, some people have, uh, have different uh, concerns. So right. I'm interested to see how the, uh, the mini pit boss uh, is received. Well, if you'd uh, like to learn more about uh, Greg Lightfoot Knives, you can find him online at lightfootknives.com. He's also on Instagram at Greg Lightfoot123. And uh, again, we mentioned the uh, June 20th town hall where uh, Mr. Lightfoot joined us and also had a sneak peek into his uh, collection of arrows and uh, and arrowheads. So that was yeah. kind of uh, kind of fascinating too as well. Got a very sneak peek on that. So you have to check that on the Knife Junkies uh, YouTube channel again, the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube. So in closing, Jim, all I have to say is that uh, as my element has uh, has really become mine and broken in beautifully, but his 30 years, 33 years of experience in building these things is evident. And uh, now it's wet my appetite to try more. There you go, folks. You heard it right here. Uh, his, uh, Bob's ever-growing uh, list of knives that he must purchase. Um, I don't know, Bob. Might, might be running out of paper putting that uh, that list together. Well, I don't like using the word purchase. I like the word uh, the term come by. Oh. Knives I hope to come by. One just happens to pop up. <laughs> you're, you're poised and ready. All right. Exactly. What term do you like to use for your uh, list of knives that you would like to purchase? Love to hear that. Call us on the listener line, 724-466-4487. Also, let us know any thoughts about Lightfoot Knives or this interview that you'd love to share. We would love to hear from you. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person, saying thanks for joining us on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Point.